So we've got 10 minutes until my talk where I'm just gonna be reading a bunch of my writing. And I've got multiple web browser tabs up right now with like years worth of my writing in there. And I'm just gonna read it. So uh, some of the topics I've written about over the years were very much about specific cyber attacks that have happened. Uh, the articles I've chosen to read today are topics that I believe are still relevant right now. So over the years, my writing has been on so many tech company blogs. We've got AT&T Cybersecurity, which was formerly Alien Vault. So I was writing content for Alien Vault back then too. We've got Blackberry Silence. We've got stuff that I've written for their Threat Vector blog. Um, I spent the summer of 2017 working for Sophos's Naked Security blog. So I've got some great content there to read as well. Um, and if I run out of my own content, I can always look up cybersecurity stories off of Google News and then give you my opinions about them. So I believe my boyfriend, Jason, is watching right now. So uh, hi, Jay. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look through the chat here on my phone. My phone is muted. We don't want to have that dreaded echo effect happening. So I'm gonna say, hi, everyone on Twitch. And then I'm going to switch over to YouTube and I'm going to say, yes, Jay got me these headphones. And I'm going to hit send. So, yeah. So, how is everyone doing today? Where, where in the world are most people right now? Are you in the United States, Canada, Europe, Africa, Asia? Asia is a massive continent. We've got Australia, New Zealand, Oceania, which are like all those islands in the southeastern quadrant of the globe. I love geography. That's one thing that people don't know about me. I am a total, maybe not geography in general nerd, but definitely a cartography nerd. Um, fascinating autism fact about me. I love reading maps. I love reading maps, especially maps of areas that I am personally familiar with, but I'm older than I look. And I remember a world not only before Google Maps, but also before MapQuest. Uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, people would visit MapQuest's website and they would print off maps off of their printers and then have the printout uh, in the front passenger seat. Those were the days before then. People usually use Rand McNally. And I remember like throughout, you know, the early 90s, mid 90s, late 90s, uh, Crawley family car trips where we'd actually have a giant like Rand McNally atlas with all kinds of like highlighter marks on the pages. So, but if you're, if you are Gen Z or Gen Z or a Zoomer, you probably don't remember a world before everyone had access to GPS and Google Maps on the phones. Yeah, but it was it was quite a time. It was quite a oh wait. Okay, Google thought that I wanted to bring up maps. No. Stop it, Google. I didn't want you to bring up the map application. You know what? It's uh it's eleven fifty-three a.m. in Toronto. Um, I've given myself an hour just to read some of my own cybersecurity content. 
I hope no one's too disappointed if I just start now. So I'm actually due to the nature of disinfosec, I think one of the first things I should read would be something that I wrote for AT&T Cybersecurity's blog back in November of last year, so November 2019. Uh, the editor that I've been working for AT&T Cybersecurity, her name is Kate Brew, and when she found out how I went through the autism diagnosis process um, in early 2019, she invited me to write this piece for AT&T Cybersecurity's blog. And Kate has really been very good at like getting some really good content out of me. I've had a lot of great editors over the years and they've really helped me grow professionally. So I uh, shout out to Kate Brew, because uh, she, a lot of the times I give these corporate tech blogs pitches, but this is actually based on a pitch that they gave me. And the title of this piece is The Surprising Truth About Cybersecurity and Autism. And later on, if you want to read it, it's on AT&T Cybersecurity's blog. So here goes. I've worked in cybersecurity for about a decade, but I've been autistic for my entire life. Careers usually start in adulthood, but autism is something children are born with. And contrary to what some people assume, autism doesn't disappear at age 18. Autism is for life. Unfortunately, once autistic people become adults, services become a lot less plentiful. For each professional who diagnoses autism in adults, there are dozens or possibly hundreds of professionals who only diagnose autism in children. There, are, there exists an entire industry of supposed treatments for autistic children. This is getting a bit dark right now. Some of those supposed treatments are obviously harmful and should be illegal, like bleach-based snake oil to be administered to children orally or through a different anatomical vector. Others, like applied behavioral analysis, are widely condemned by autistic adults, rightfully so. Forcing autistic children to pretend to be neurotypical doesn't cure them of autism and will ultimately backfire in PTSD and depression. I suspect treatments for autistic adults are few and far between because there's little money to be made there. An autistic adult like myself can usually deny consent to a supposed treatment, whereas children usually cannot. Autistic people need support to manage life in a neurotypical world and acceptance for harmless traits such as hand flapping and obsessive focus on topics of interest. There are symptoms of my autism that can be difficult, such as my hypersensitivity to the sound of vacuum cleaners. This is a totally vacuum cleaner for your apartment, by the way. All the floors in this place are pine or tile. So, Thank goodness for that. I don't like carpets. Uh, so back to my article here. Uh, my hypersensitivity to the sound of... There are symptoms of my autism that can be difficult, such as my hypersensitivity to the sound of vacuum cleaners and the feel of chalk on my hands and my dyspraxia, which is a medical term for clumsiness. But my autism comes with many positive traits too. The psychologist who diagnosed me with autism spectrum disorder one in April, 2019, says that I have an exceptional long-term memory. And when I'm interested in something, my thirst for knowledge is immense. I'm certain that I wouldn't be a successful cybersecurity blogger if it weren't for my autism. Research is my life's work and I can do so with remarkable intensity. Like most autistic adults, I would refuse a hypothetical cure for autism because if it weren't for my autism, I just wouldn't be myself. Everyone on earth has strengths and weaknesses. It's best to simply manage my weaknesses so I don't lose my strengths. Not all, but many autistic teenagers and adults have a natural talent for computer technology. In fact, an obsession with computers is a part of many autism stereotypes. Computers are logical. If a computer malfunctions, there's a clear reason for it that can be discovered with proper troubleshooting. 
Computers don't demand uncomfortable eye contact unless you're using iris scanning biometrics. Computers and the internet are a gateway to a massive and ever-growing collection of knowledge. Computers facilitate social media, online chat, and email. So you can socialize with other people without their physical presence and without possibly misinterpreted body language. Some autistics, especially those with high support needs, are nonverbal or selectively mute. Many autistic children and adults with high support needs or intellectual disabilities are assumed to lack the ability to communicate with language unless they're given PCs, phones, or augmented and alternative communication devices. With access to technology as an alternative means to, as an alternative to verbal speech, neurotypical people in their lives are shocked to learn that artistics who are assumed to be unintelligent because they don't speak have been capable of sophisticated language, sorry, sophisticated intelligence all along. Imagine how frustrating it is to not have a means of communication. Computer technology can make it possible. The affinity most autistics have for computers have clear and simple reasons. The world is going to need more and more cybersecurity professionals as time goes on. As more and more people are discovered to be autistic, it would be great to harness our talents into improving the security of computer technology. I'm one autistic in the cybersecurity industry, but I know many others. And if autistics with low and high support needs are given the opportunity to learn about cybersecurity and pursue careers in our field, the world would be a better place. My friend and colleague, Kay O'Flaherty, explored the benefits of getting more autistic people into cybersecurity roles in a 2018 piece for Forbes. So she wrote, Mike Spain, director at Cyber Exchange and founder and chair of the Cyber Neurodiversity Group, thinks neurodiverse adults can make a huge difference. Actually, the proper word is neurodivergent. Um, the term refers to individuals with spectrum conditions, including autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, and OCD. Neurodivergent individuals have a lot to offer. Their strengths include cognitive pattern recognition, outside the box thinking, attention to detail, logical and methodical thinking, focus and integrity, says Spain. Diverse teams are more productive, more creative and more successful, he says. Spain emphasizes the importance of recognizing the commercial benefits of neurodiverse recruitment rather than treating the area solely as a corporate social responsibility. So back to my narrative. He points out that some firms have a 50% increase in productivity on certain tasks <coughs> I should have a sip of a beverage here. He points out that some firms have seen a 50% increase in productivity on certain tasks performed by neurodivergent individuals, which is the kind of figure that makes the board listen. And of course, employing neurodivergent young people also has the wider benefit of helping to stop talented individuals from turning to the dark side of hacking. I have a strong belief that as a sector, we have a responsibility to not neurodiverse individuals, says Spain. I'm really glad I managed to get into the cybersecurity field without a black hat phase. I would strongly dissuade the idea of engaging in actual cyber attacks as opposed to consensual penetration testing as a means to a cybersecurity career. You'd likely get caught and do prison time without being offered professional opportunities upon release. The era of entering cybersecurity like Kevin Mitnick did is a relic of the late 20th century. So if we can get autistic hackers to only hack for the good guys, we'll all benefit with more secure endpoints, applications, and computer networks. A few years ago, Wired's Kevin Felfrey identified how employing more autistic people in cybersecurity roles is a special interest that our industry really needs. So he wrote, the common prejudice is that people with autism spectrum disorder have limited skills and are difficult to work with. To the extent that's true, it's a measure of our failure as a society. Almost half of all those diagnosed with ASD are of average or above average intellectual ability. And we have clear evidence that job focused training and support services especially in transition to adulthood, can make a huge difference, leading to higher levels of employment, more independence, and better quality of life. Back to my prose. 
more than three quarters of cognitively able individuals with autism have aptitudes and interests that make them well suited to cybersecurity careers. These include being very analytical and detail oriented as well as honest and respectful of rules. And there are many other areas which these talents could quite literally be employed. A few innovative firms, including Microsoft, SAP, and Freddie Mac already have pilot programs for hiring autistic people to fill sophisticated IT jobs and other positions. The Gates Foundation, the Millikan Institute, and the Hillbrand Foundation have also funded valuable employment and research programs. But given the coming tsunami of autistic adults, a much broader effort will be required. We need a national strategy coordinating the efforts of public agencies, companies, and organizations to bring these valuable minds to the workforce. As an autistic adult with a well-established cybersecurity career, I have unique insight as to how to get autistic people into our field and to keep us employed and productive. Parents of autistic children and teenagers should be informed of how cybersecurity careers can help their offspring become independent and successful adults. This can be done through public schools and through specialists who treat autistic children and adults. Does your child spend hours on PCs, phones, and tablets with obsessive hyperfocus? Encourage it, as long as it doesn't interfere with other parts of their lives. Has your child taught themselves impressive computer skills on their own? Let them know that a career in cybersecurity can be an option for them. Colleges and universities could establish scholarships for autistic teenagers and adults to pursue computer science and information technology pathways to cybersecurity careers. But getting autistic people interested in cybersecurity is only half of the battle. The other half is to keep them in cybersecurity targeted educational programs and professional employment. Assess the sensory sensitivity needs of autistic students and employees. If fluorescent lighting disturbs them, consider replacing it with incandescent lighting. If autistic students and adults are hypersensitive to fragrances, ban perfume from schools and workplaces. Sensory needs can vary greatly from one autistic person to another. The only way you can be certain of what they are is to ask autistic people about them directly. Help autistic students and employees with their executive dysfunction. Honestly, executive dysfunction is the area that I'm most disabled in. So executive function is the ability to make and execute plans and tasks, and my brain is weak in that area. My executive dysfunction is one of the ways I'm most greatly disabled. It was a factor in why I dropped out of school. Now as a cybersecurity blogger in my adulthood, I found ways to cope. I make countless research notes in Google Keep. Evernote and similar applications can be used as well. Notes can be set with their own timed alarms. For instance, if one of my editors wants a draft for a blog piece by a particular date, I can make a note about it and have it notify me at a time when I must work on it. I also keep track of what I work um, of what work I must do by keeping emails from editors in my inbox and reviewing them in my inbox when I have a feeling that I must work on something. If there are particular times that companies that I work for, such as AT&T Cybersecurity, would like to have a phone call or online meeting with me, I always mark the time on my Google Calendar and set many notifications on it. Computer technology can be harnessed to help me compensate for my executive dysfunction. It can work for other autistic people too. Autistic people are often bullied and harassed at work and school due to ableism, the prejudice against disabled people. Policies and their enforcement must be set in place to discourage bullying and harassment. Bullying is the other reason why I dropped out of high school and I'm very lucky that I was able to succeed despite of that. Other autistics might not be as lucky, so take bullying and harassment seriously in order to keep us in school and work. And here's my final word of advice. Make sure you communicate clearly with autistic students and employees. Our brains don't work very well with sarcasm, figures of speech, vagueness, or metaphors. Do you know a meeting is supposed to start in three hours? Tell them the exact time the meeting is supposed to start rather than saying we have a meeting later on today. Instead of saying it's raining like cats and dogs or the boss will kill you if she finds out about this, say it's raining very heavily or the boss would get upset if you did that. Instead of sarcastically saying, nice work, buddy, say you didn't do a very good job. I'll explain how we can improve. We can get more autistic people into cybersecurity careers and keep them there. 
The future of cybersecurity depends on it. Thank you very much. That's uh, the first thing that I'm going to read. So it's 12.08 p.m. in Toronto right now, and my time slot runs until 12.30. So I've got roughly another 22 minutes to fill here. So that's great. I'm going to, there we go, checking all my screens. I'm going to pull up another article to read. Let's see, should I read something else I wrote for AT&T Cybersecurity? Or I've written a lot of cool stuff for Sophos Naked Security too. Uh, here's a really interesting piece. I wrote it nearly three years ago. It was published September 13th, 2017. Uh, September 13th, 2017, and it's on uh, Sophos' Naked Security blog, and it's titled, Fears Raised About Accuracy of New Forensic DNA Techniques. So, genetic science has progressed significantly in recent years, and it influences how crime is being investigated in the United States and elsewhere. DNA analysis started being used to identify crime suspects about 30 years ago, with the first conviction thanks to DNA evidence happening in 1986. It's easy to assume from watching TV crime drama series that DNA evidence is irrefutable because that's how it's portrayed in fictional criminal courts. The Guardian interviewed Professor Sherry Forbes for the Center of Forensic Science at the University of Technology, Sydney, about this matter. So she said, the problem we find is that juries increasingly expect DNA to be collected from every single crime scene, and when it's not, either because it can't be found or it wasn't required, we end up spending a lot of time explaining why. Forbes also mentioned that people in the general public who become jury members will often assume that if no DNA was found in a crime scene, that means the perpetrator wasn't there. So it might surprise many that there's a controversy regarding the accuracy of two particular DNA analysis methods. Up until recently, DNA forensics laboratories would only use DNA samples larger than a few hundred picograms. A picogram is one trillionth of a gram. Smaller quantities of DNA are often more difficult to test, especially with older DNA analysis methodologies. Since 1999, the UK Forensic Science Service has used a DNA profiling technique called low copy number, which can analyze DNA samples as low as 100 picograms. The DNA laboratory in the office of New York City's chief medical examiner has introduced two DNA profiling techniques designed to analyze even smaller DNA samples. The lab's Dr. Teresa A. Karagaini, I think that's how her name is pronounced, a forensic scientist, developed the high sensitivity testing method and implemented it in 2006. After several years of experience with that method, Karagaini or Karagain and Dr. Adele A. Mitchell invented the forensic statistical tool, which is specialized forensic DNA analysis software. Both methods are still being used to test really tiny DNA samples, as well as DNA samples which may contain genetic material from more than one person. That's not how forensic DNA testing was done in the 1990s, or even in the first decade of the 21st century. According to the lab's former director, Dr. Metschild Prince in 2009, a couple of years ago, DNA testing was limited to bodily fluids, semen, blood, and saliva. Now, every laboratory in the country routinely receives swabs from guns. So, semen, blood, and saliva produce much larger DNA samples than can be acquired from the traces of skin sebum or sweat which is left on objects. Plus, tiny DNA traces can be found on objects are a lot more likely to be mixed with DNA from other people. The forensic analysis of very tiny amounts of DNA is a difficult area. According to a report from Promega, a biotechnology firm, every lab faces samples with low amounts of DNA. Laboratories and DNA analysis need to choose whether or not to attempt an enhanced interrogation technique, such as increasing the cycle number, 
desalting samples or higher capillary electrophoresis injection. If such an approach is taken, validation studies need to be performed to develop appropriate interpretation guidelines and to assess the degree of variation that should be expected when analyzing low amounts of DNA. Deciding where to stop testing or interpreting data can be very challenging. Some laboratories stop testing based on a certain amount of, in, of input DNA, using validation data to underpin a, quanti a quantitation threshold. Others set sort of chastic thresholds that are used to, during data interpretation to decide which STR typing data are reliable. Both the high sensitivity testing and forensic statistical tool methodologies are now being legally contested. A group of defense lawyers have asked the New York State Inspector General's Office to launch an inquiry into thousands of criminal cases that have used the methodologies in New York City's DNA lab. Because the lab uses cutting edge techniques, they also test DNA samples provided by the police departments all across the United States, not just in New York. On September 1st, that I would assume that's 2017, the Legal Aid Society and Federal Defenders of New York alleged that the Medical Examiner's Office in New York has engaged in negligent conduct that undermines the integrity of its forensic DNA testing and analysis. Dr. Eli Shapiro, the former mitochondrial DNA technical leader in the DNA lab, wrote to New York Times saying that he has retired early due to the stress of having to remove to a, sorry approve lab reports generated by the forensic statistical tool. He said in court that he finds the forensic statistical tools process to be very disturbing. Dr. Bruce Buddle, I, I think it's pronounced Buddle, who helped design the FBI's national DNA database believes that the New York lab's statistical methods are not defensible. Including to Buddle, the FST was designed with the incorrect assumption that every DNA mixture of the same size was missing information or had been contaminated in just the same way. He said, five-person mixtures can look like three-person. Four contributors can look like two-person mixtures. It's almost impossible to actually be accurate. FST's developers have acknowledged a margin of error of 30% in their method of quantifying the amount of DNA in a sample, but they still stand behind the accuracy of their software. It seems that New York's criminal court may have been too hasty in accepting new DNA forensics methodologies that have yet to be proven to have reliable accuracy. And it's possible, therefore, that there could be thousands of people in American prisons who are falsely convicted due to forensic DNA technologies that were properly studied before they were deployed. And that's the end of that piece. So it's 12, 16 p.m. in Toronto, and I still have about 14 minutes to fill. So I'm gonna read something else here. Okay, so we've got an article that I wrote for Blackberry Silence's Threat Vector blog. It was published on September 27th, 2018, and it's titled, Think Twice Before You Spy on an iPhone. So apps designed to be used to spy on mobile device users already exist in, in murky ethical territory. Even if the people you're spying on are your children, your partner, or others, if you trust a spyware developer to be careful about your privacy, you may be unpleasantly surprised. In early September, which is 2018, by the way, people who use mSpy's iOS apps to spy on other users have found their spying data, passwords, and their mSpy transaction history exposed in a publicly accessible web database which doesn't require any sort of authentication. You would be surprised how many vulnerabilities I've written about that are that ridiculous. So anyway, this is the second known mSpy data breach since 2015. The database from the 2018 breach was taken offline in early September. 
mSpy is legally sold software and an app must be deliberately installed on the devices that you want to spy on in a way that requires physical access. If a malicious cyber attacker wanted to use mSpy, they'd absolutely need to be able to have their hands on your phone for a few minutes. Using mSpy requires a subscription fee. The fee this fee ranges from $29.99 for one month to $203.88 for 12 months with three different service tiers. The basic tier includes GPS location data access, locally stored photos and videos, email, call history, and SMS access, web browsing history, and knowledge of installed applications. The premium tier, which requires jailbreaking the iOS device you want to spy on, includes all of the basic features, plus a keylogger, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Skype, and Snapchat access, Wi-Fi usage information, geofencing, call blocking, alerts of uninstalls, and unlimited changing of, sorry, unlimited changing of spy devices, yeah. Security researcher Natish Shah brought news of NSPY's latest data breach to Brian Krebs' attention. The information that was leaked in the publicly accessible web database included usernames, passwords, encryption keys, and Apple iCloud authentication data. The leaked encryption keys enabled access to spyware acquired data that only paid NSPY users were supposed to have access to on the devices they were set up to monitor. The breach data is from iOS users who have used mSpy at least once in the last six months. The specific number of affected users isn't available, but Krebs says the number is in the millions. Shaw said that mSpy's developer ignored his warning about the latest breach. Shaw said, I was chatting with their live support until they blocked me when I asked them to get in contact with their CTO or head of security. An individual who simply gave their name as Andrew claiming to be mSpy's chief security officer, said to Krebs, we have been working hard to secure our system from any possible leaks, attacks, and private information disclosure. BS. All our customers' accounts are securely encrypted, and the data is being wiped out once in a short period of time. Thanks to you, we have prevented this possible breach, and from what we can discover, the data that you're talking about could be the amount of customers' emails and possibly other data. However, we could only find that there are only a few points of access and activity with the data. Also BS. But this 2018 incident is mSpy's second known data breach in nearly three years. That doesn't give me a lot of faith in their attitude toward the security of their paying users. The first known data breach was in May 2015. The database with the data that from that breach was on the dark web and only accessible through Tor. The leaked data includes emails, Apple IDs, text messages, payment, and location data. At least 400,000 paid M spy users were impacted with about 145,000 financial transactions exposed. M spy representatives flat out denied the breach for about a week. You can security harden against having mSpy used on you by setting up a lock screen on your phone, which requires authentication in order to be accessed. iPhone 10 recently debuted Apple's Face ID biometrics, which if you deploy properly would make it even more difficult for someone to put an app like mSpy on your phone. Depending on where you live and some other factors about how you use spyware, software like mSpy can be legally murky. Stealth Genie is very similar spyware, and the company CEO, Hamad Akbar, was arrested in September 2014. Regarding the matter, U.S. attorney Dana Boenti said, advertising and selling spyware technology is a criminal offense, and such conduct will be aggressively pursued by this office and by our law enforcement partners. So my advice can be summed up like this. Watch your phone's physical security, know where it is at all times, and set up a lock screen with a good authentication vector. Also, don't trust spyware app developers. Any developer that wants to enable you to do something that could be legally or ethically controversial may be similarly unethical and reckless toward their own customers. And that's, that's some of the better advice I've ever given professionally. Yeah, um, F spyware developers, man. So it's 
12.23 p.m. I'm just going to look at Zoom again. And the next talk is by Tinker. Sorry, Tinker. So that's going to be in about seven minutes. I'm going to look at Twitch briefly. And look at YouTube as well. Okay, okay. So we got that. And now I'm looking at YouTube. Thank goodness my phone's got a lot of memory too. Yeah, I agree, Spencer Hundley, about that DNA article that I wrote for Sophos. The amount of error accepted in forensic evidence is just unacceptable. I'm sorry if I mispronounce some words related to DNA jargon. I'm very good with IT and computer science jargon, but there are a lot of words related to DNA forensic analysis that are a little tricky for me to pronounce. My ear is getting a little sore. I should adjust my headphones. There we go. Maybe I've got time to read one last thing before we get Thinker on here. Um, I'm hoping that RS is Thinker. I'm looking at Zoom right now. Okay, so we'll read one last thing very briefly. So, weak PKI implementation is a major cyber risk, and this was published November 8th, 2018 on Venify's blog. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, this is, this, this is a short article. I can read it quickly. Public key infrastructure is the backbone of your network security. As much of your data in transit as possible should be encrypted. Your PKI helps to make sure that your certificates are used and distributed in a secure way. But if your PKI is poorly implemented, it can be easy for cyber attackers to access your sensitive data. Venify is proud to be a sponsor of Poneman Institute's recently released 2018 Global PKI Trend Study. For the study, Poneman surveyed 1,688 IT professionals in regions around the world, including the United States, Australia, Brazil, France, Germany, India, Japan, Russia, and the United Kingdom. Poneman's research reveals some worrisome findings about how organizations worldwide implement and deploy PKI. How can enterprise maintain control over their PKI without clear ownership? In order for responsibilities to be taken care of, someone or some entity must be responsible. This is a challenge for most of the organizations that Poneman surveyed. About 69.5% of survey respondents said there's no clear ownership of their PKI. That's terrifying, by the way. There are also related concerns. About 36% of organizations say that they have a lack of visibility of the applications that will depend on PKI. Organizations have an average of about eight applications which use PKI, such as network infrastructure, VPN, device authentication, and email. What can't be seen can't be kept secure. Could the lack of clear ownership have something to do with that? As far as PKI implementation is challenges are concerned, an average of 46.5% cite insufficient skills and 44.5% cite insufficient resources. These sound like problems that can be solved with investments in training and increases in IT budgets. About 39% of respondents say that their PKI deployment faces too much change or uncertainty. I can see specific training staff programs as part of the solution. It's worth it to have your workers learn in depth about how to maintain and modify PKI to suit both current and future security needs. Frequent security testing by internal cybersecurity professionals and external third parties can also help an organization learn how to adjust and improve their PKI implementation. When a new PKI dependent application is deployed, it becomes especially important to test its security. Also having PKI implementation visit, so PKI application visibility is an important must in order to adapt to change. A lot of the problems discovered in this study are related to and directly affect each other. 
Secure PKI implementation usually also requires visibility and control of all of an organization's certificate authorities. That's because 56% of respondents deploy enterprise PKI through internal corporate CAs, and 40% of, re of respondents use externally hosted private CAs. 33% of the respondents use a public CA service, and 23% use a private CA running within a public cloud. As I'm sorry, an organization may have a hybrid network that exists both on the in the cloud and on premises, and some organizations have CAs from multiple types of sources. Organizations use an average of eight separate issuing certificate authorities with an average of eight distinct applications that need PKI. A lack of visibility in all of that can have serious consequences. Cyber attackers may be able to easily bypass the encryption of your data. When so, the good news is that these are solvable problems. Your organization ought to review how you deploy PKI and if further training, a larger budget and greater visibility is required, uh, such efforts will be worth it. When cyber attackers can intercept your sensitive data, the financial and reputational damage to an organization can be rather serious. And it 